Today, we're talking with Matt Young, a winter finch expert who particularly loves crossbills, which are known for their crossed mandibles. Matt is also president of the Finch Research Network. The network is a new endeavor dedicated to the study and conservation of finches and their habitats globally. Please enjoy the following interview where we talk to Matt about winter finches, the research network, and more. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We have Matt Young here. He's collaborated with, collaborated with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and he's starting a finch research network. So thanks for joining us, Matt, and uh, we appreciate having you on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, kind of long over. I don't know it's long overdue, but we've talked about it for a little while, at least. So. Yeah, and I don't think that I know anybody that has as much passion for winter finches and especially crossbills as you. And I didn't know how much of passion it was until we became Facebook friends. And I saw like your first 10 things you posted were all about crossbills. I was like, okay, this this yeah. is the crossbill guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of funny that nickname. I don't know if you guys call it. The, the lab actually ran a piece on me not that long ago. It was an insert piece this past February, I think it was, or January, in the winter finch, it was a winter finch forecast piece on Ron Pittaway's forecast that he's been doing for over 20 years, I think it is. You guys are familiar with the winter finch forecast that Ron yeah. has done. Yeah. I always and, look forward to that forecast, oh, but sometimes it lets me down, so I don't know. I guess I have mixed feelings about it. Why not? Someone should explain for people that don't know, though. Well, the finch forecast is Ron Pittaway collects who also is about as passionate about finches as I am. If there's anybody that is, he's probably right there. Because he, I feel like uh, if I have anything to owe the Finch Network to, it would be Ron because he's really started that network before I even came up with this idea. But anyway, um, yeah, Ron collects uh, conifer or, or food crop data from a number of sources across Canada. And then puts this forecast together based on, you know, whether spruce is a good cone crop in certain parts of the boreal or pine, or even some of, uh, you know, for, for frugivores like pine, grosbeak and bohemian wax, I mean, what's the mountain ash crop doing across the boreal? And so he collects his data from a number of, of people in the Finch network, really, um, and, and then collates that data and then puts out this forecast every year right around the, the, uh, the uh, what's it, fall equinox. September 23rd is usually when he puts that out. You know, it's one of those things everybody kind of looks forward to. But if it's a bad year, it's kind of depressing. And this past year was a bad year, too. So we were like, oh, I guess we're not having any fun this winter yeah. so the I pine trees. The idea behind it is it's a forecast that's going to tell you if these winter finches are going to make it into your area or not. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you for adding that. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, you know, based on the food sources to the north, if it's a great food source to the north, they're going to largely stay there. If it's a bad food source to the north, they're going to erupt. And, you know, that's, again, kind of whether it's uh, conifer seed for crossbills and siskins or birch crops for red poles, for mountain ash, for pine grosbeak, beak, for tree seeds, for evening grosbeak, beak, you know, because they eat a lot of ash and maple tree seeds and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, two years ago, we had a great year. And then last year was a bust year. Uh, and it's really only geared towards mostly, you know, eastern North America. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of for the Northeast Great Lakes. I've helped some with collecting uh, data for crops for crossbills out west because people don't realize most of your red crossbills, you know, red crossbill is really not a boreal species per se. I mean, there are certainly crossbills, red crossbills in the boreal, but they're a montane western species is where a lot of these eruptive birds uh, kind of come from. So you kind of have to know what the Western hemlock crop or the Ponderosa pine crop or Douglas fir crop is doing in the Western part of the United States to determine whether red crossbills are coming uh, eastward or not. So he's given me a plug every year. I feel like, uh, you know, he always kind of gears the red crossbill uh, forecast based on my reports. 
and then he always gives me a plug, like, please, you know, submit recordings to Macaulay Library or send them to Matt Young. There's all the different types. That's something that stuck out to me a lot when learning about them. There Are they subspecies or just differences in melody? Like, what's the difference? Do they breed with each other? Well, yeah, they, well, they don't really, by the traditional definition of subspecies, meet kind of the definition for subspecies, because most definitions of subspecies, they're, they're allopatric, they're not sympatric. Crossbill, call types, um, do come in contact with one another. Um, when they, when, when cone crops bust, in an area like a core zone of occurrence like say for type three which is you know i mean i'm not a big lover of calling these things western hemlock crossbill or Douglas for crossbill because it implies that they're flying around looking for this you know a tree species but that um so you know with 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 you know these western hemlock birds they'll you know when the cone crops fail in Western Hemlock or Sitka Spruce, where they're found in the Pacific Northwest, they'll make these big movements east. You know, they'll come in contact with, you know, eastern, this northeastern bird or type one. And uh, you can get hybridization at low levels. Um, the interesting thing is, is I'm not really a big, I don't really necessarily think we're going to see a lot of splits. Um, with red cross bill call types. So I, I should answer your original question. So with the call type, Groff basically went around, was recording these birds in the 80s. And the, the idea with the call type is, is there's an implied ecological specialization of sorts. That light call type wants to mate with light call type. And there's slight differences in bill morphologies for each of the types that lead to, you know, better foraging efficiencies in certain conifers. I'm not a lover of the single key conifer concept. I think they have a core zone of occurrence. I think within that core zone of occurrence, they conifer switch. So they, they move around a uh, feeding on whatever conifers are in that core zone of occurrence that are most common. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean the, the key conifer. It could be an alternate conifer because that year, you know, the cones, that, that particular tree species might have produced a better cone crop than the one that, you know, was described as a key conifer. So does that, does that answer the question with... Yeah, the so you almost describe it as like tribes, like there's different tribes of crossbills? Yeah, it's not a bad way of looking at it. Um, I mean, Tom Hahn, so there's a a couple new big players that have been on this scene for a long time. And it was, you know, Groff described the call type phenomenon and then Bankman at the University of, of Wyoming, he's the one that described Castro crossbill, which is the new species. You guys knew that, right? There was a new species of crossbill. I hadn't heard about it, no. Yeah, two, two years ago, there was, or maybe three years ago now, um, type nine was elevated to species status. Oh. Um, and so, you know, Craig's done a lot of these kind of foraging efficiency papers and studies about, you know, and that's what's kind of linked them to certain conifer species. Um, the fascinating thing about the Cache Across Bill, which is named after a county in Idaho, because that's the only place it actually occurs, is in Cache County. Idaho is in the late 90s, Craig started to go, started to ask himself, where can I find a, a mountain range east of the Rockies of live full pine, which produces one of the most reliable cone crops in the world? But where can I find live full pine east of the Rockies um, where there was an absence of tree squirrels? Um, so tree squirrels drive cone evolution. And if you take tree squirrels out of the equation, crossbills drive cone evolution. Uh, that's, that's pretty what interesting. 
That's one yeah, of the most interesting things I've heard about this probably thus far. I feel like crossbills are a species of bird that almost nobody really knows about, with the exception of probably you and a few other big names. Because to me, they always were something that was kind of this elusive, strange creature that would show up every now and then in an eruptive state. And you only see them for a short amount of time, and then all of a sudden they're gone with the rest of their uh, their flock. So. Okay. Absolutely. They are uh, endlessly fascinating and they do have an air of mystery or mystique or whatever you want to call it. All the finches do. The, a lot of the eruptive finches certainly have that mystique to them to some degree, but you know, Red Cross still in particular has that dynamic going on. Let's talk about the Finch Research Network that you're going to be launching. Yeah, so... You know, this is kind of a brainchild of, of, well, it's, you know, several of us over time. Um, you know, it's been something I've kind of wanted to do, um, but where it really kind of hatched out of is, you know, Tim Spar, Lance Benner, a few other guys I've had this discussion with, you know, even to some extent, I think I've had this discussion with uh, Ryan Brady and Nick Anich uh, in the past. Um, but more so, like Tim was, you know, in Lance, Benner in California, they were flying around to collecting data, you know, and it was kind of out of their own pocket. And then I, I kind of then, you know, started to, to have some internal discussions with, you know, some people at the lab and with others of like, hey, you know, where can I find a small grant to at least cover travel for this kind of thing? And then that just kind of, one thing led to another, you know, and then I, you know, I decided, you know, I, you know, I should launch this after some nudging from other people. So, you know, the idea is, is, you know, the Crossville project will be the flagship project of it. Um, I have others uh, on board, like, like Jeff Roth, um, but I have Tom Hahn on board and Jamie Cornelius, some of the best Finch researchers um, that are out there. You know, we want to do more than just cross bills. I mean, Patrick Franke in Germany is another one um, that I've been collaborating with for years. Um, and some other people too, you know, Han also had students, Tom Han at UC Davis had students that looked at even gross beak call plates as well as you guys probably are at least a little bit familiar. There's five call types of even gross beaks as well. Um, and it would be great to look at a sort of mating, you know, on, on a more wider scale, both in Red Cross Bill, even in Grosbeak, maybe even, you know, Hall Finch in Europe, which is closely related to even Grosbeak. Um, so that's kind of where we're going with some of this. So we had 28, you know, ARU units put out in four strategic areas of North America just in the last few weeks. Um, to kind of hopefully collect some pilot data, so additional pilot data. And, you know, we put them in four strategic areas um, because I've been, you know, kind of like looking at this landscape for a long time. And there are certain areas of the country where I think there's a higher diversity and density of cost of call types so if you put out these ARU units, you're going to collect some data and then hopefully write a bigger grant to kind of go after uh, an assortative mating study to see, do they assortively mate, does light call type mate with light call type under changing environmental conditions? Not only in Red Cross Bill, but also, like I said, evening growth peak and perhaps off finch in the UK and so on and so forth. So. Um, that's kind of where we're going with, you know, the, the Finch Research Network. I mean, I, we have interested, you know, we have a team of researchers that are interested in looking at bullfinches. Um, and we hope to collaborate with them. You know, the red pole scene is an ever-evolving scene as well. That's you a know, whole nother discussion for, you know, hours and hours of that situation. So yeah. I mean, that's definitely interesting as well. In essence, it's going to be a collection of a bunch of different Finch data. That's what we want to do. It's really all about the network. We want everybody 
to be, you know, part of this. I mean, it could be citizen science. It could be some really kind of higher end people targeting certain studies in certain parts of the country as well. Like this is sort of the meeting thing. But I mean, just people making recordings and putting them into the Macaulay Library is is huge. I mean, like I said, it's, you know, it's the most, you know, that is the most recordings of any species. So once that once that thing launches, how can people get involved with it? You mentioned submitting recordings. That's a great way to to help with Finch research. Submitting recordings to the Macaulay Library. What are some so, other things people might be able to do? Um, well, there could be submitting of recordings. There also could be, um, you know, people going out. And, uh, people could also donate recording gear. It could be there's going to be a donate button so there'll be fundraising around these projects as well um but we want everybody you know even even forging data we need to get at as well um this is something that you know tom Hahn and i have and jamie cornelius and jeff Graff, all of us really have talked about you know let's get forging data you know to see really how you know, what is, how eclectic is the diet of a certain type um, from year after year after year after year? You know, we're in this day and age now of, of apps and iNaturalist and, you know, eBird app. You know, everybody's constantly putting data in. So there's no reason we shouldn't be able to try to collect foraging data as well. Um, but like, I, you know, I, you know, I don't necessarily see, you know, going after big academic grants, although that certainly is part of the dynamic. But you know, we want everybody, we want just everybody to be part of this, even if it's just recordings. Because um, those recordings are valuable data points on distribution and movements. How much is the information you guys gather going to help in the conservation of some of these birds that we're seeing kind of go up farther north and not even come down as far south anymore? Maybe their numbers are just sort of declining in general. Yeah, numbers are declining. I mean, that's a well-known Canada actually listed uh, evening grosbeak as a, uh, I think it's either special concern or threatened. Um, the numbers are in big decline. Um, Believe it or not, they are a spruce budworm specialist. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, like Bay Breasted Warbler and Cape May Warbler, they are a budworm specialist. And so, you know, that, again, I can talk about Grosbeach for a long time because natural history-wise, what a fascinating story. You know, they weren't even in the East really until the late 1800s. You know, and there's this... this talk of a baited highway that they followed across the plains with box elders and they were feeding on box elder. That's interesting. And, and over time, you know, these eruptions got bigger and bigger, you know, and there were spruce budworm outbreaks and nest success was high and population numbers were growing and they were forced to move and, and they eventually got to the point where they were like, you know, they were once every five or 10 years, then they were once every three or four years, then they were once every couple of years, and then they became annual in the, in the Great Lakes and Northeast from about, what was it, from about the 1950s, maybe early 60s to about 1990. I dream of just getting up and looking outside and seeing evening gross pigs at the bird feeder. I mean, that would just be incredible. Yeah, so they were, they were annual on the Ithaca Christmas bird count from like 65 to 1990. Um, now, they started treating the, you know, the forest of Canada for budworm. And because, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, timber's a major, uh, you know, crop of sorts, you could say, a source of income. And, uh, you know, you know, and it would kill a lot of the forest up there. So they started treating it. And it's had a, you know, I don't necessarily say it's a deleterious. I mean, there's always a cost benefit analysis with this stuff. You know, yeah, timber dies and it's not as, it's not as worth as much. Um, but yeah, it's had a negative impact on some of these budworm 
for budworm specialists like eating roast beef. I mean, crossbills eat a fair amount of budworm as well, actually. So uh, they eat more insects than you guys, than it's in the literature. Yeah, I assume they were just a seed specialist, especially, you know, with that specialized bill. And they are really, I mean, that's what drives the system, but I got a report. Oh, man, what was it? From Alex Lamoureux? I think it was Alex. Um, you know, of, of them feeding on an aspen leaf. An aspen leaf something insect out in the out in parts of the west just from the other couple days ago um but yeah you know species are opportunistic period end of sentence i mean they're specialized but they're a lot more opportunistic than a lot of times the literature gives them credit for or what you think you know you read these neat and clean papers and they have their lane but you know if, if something is super abundant and it's high in protein and it's easy to feed their young I mean they're going to utilize it I mean and, and that's not just that's any species to some degree <laughs> well thanks so much for joining us we really yeah. appreciate having you on I learned a ton about crossbills and winter finches and we'll definitely have to talk to you about more stuff again especially as uh, the winter time closes in they start to move around more yeah, let, let's do it guys I mean I'm totally stoked to do some kind of live time you know, forecasting what's going on, what's the, you know, kind of the cutting edge, what's going on with, with you know, fishes at the time. Yeah. And I think thanks again, Matt. It's been really great having yeah, you. Thanks. We'll catch up with you in a bit and we'll send you the files before we post them for you to check. All right, guys, man. Thanks a lot for having me. Yep. yep have a good one. Bye. Yeah, you too. Later. Bye.